Good morning, guys. I think I know everybody in the house, including all guests, so we'll just kind of dive right in as we continue into our series that we've been in. Now, before I get talking about the series, I want to talk about something that's coming up a little bit later. Uh, We are having our communion today as part of our service, and if you've not been here before uh, for our communion service, I just want to explain what's coming because at that point, I just kind of want to go with the flow. I don't want to do a lot of instructions. But when we do communion, we always do what's called a Stephen Fund collection. Uh, so you will get an offering go by again. That's simply for us who are fellowshippers, uh, following the fourth century practice of taking care of those in need during the time of, of coming and remembering the Lord. So that's just uh, a collection. 100% of that goes to helping people in need or helping agencies in town to help people in need as a part of our ministry. So just as the Spirit leads, and then we'll take communion. Anyone who has accepted Jesus as leader and forgiver in their life is welcome to the table. Uh, what I mean by that is, according to the Scripture, is if you've acknowledged that He is the Son of God and make Him Lord in your life, or that He's God and you're not, and you take and uh, believe in your heart, die was again, and receive His forgiveness, and you are saved, and you're more welcome to take communion with us. Uh, we only have that stipulation because it's biblical. And uh, then after communion, we'll continue into our time of response. So that's where we're coming later. Hopefully that doesn't throw you, if you've not been part of it before, that you're like, man, how many offerings does this church take in one gathering? You know, that type of thing. Just how we knock that out early on. Um, so we are going to go back into our series. Again, we've been in a series called Margins, which is a study in First Corinthians. Um, again, the general gist of Margins, just so I don't make Katie do all that work in vain. There we go. Um, I think black better. That's right. Is we're looking at multiple topics that Paul addressed and with the church that was struggling pretty hard. And we're looking at what, in each of these topics, what God's best is and where am I? So if we are talking about unity and forgiving others, then this, we'll talk about from what Paul has with us what that looks like. And then each of us can gauge as the Spirit speaks to our hearts what's that look like so that we can find what margin we have between where we are and where God is leading us so we can grow to be more like Christ. We define that difference, each one individually, so that we can work on that and can pray over that and be able to sharpen ourselves in that so that we're growing. So it's a very much a discipleship-based, growing to be more like Jesus type series. Uh, and then we're going to get back into it today. So, if you would, let's get Bibles out. Uh, and we're going to 1 Corinthians 10 today. 1 Corinthians 10, as we will continue through this series. Uh, again, if you don't have a Bible, there's Bibles around the room and the baskets underneath the chairs. And we also have you version up and running for those who use their tablets and phones. But we're going to get into general place and see what we've got today. Uh, today we're going to be talking about idol worship. And when I was talking about idol worship, we're not really talking uh, about, though it would definitely fall in this category, you having this little fat Buddha doll on your mantle at home that you pray to. Um, it's much broader than that. It's much bigger than that. And it's actually a great part two to the study that we did last week. Last week, if you remember, we really paused hard looking at our spiritual health to grab those things that he's been putting on our hearts and to really wrestle with, are we just coming on Sundays and saying, oh yeah, that makes sense and that's a little bit of encouragement, or are we grabbing hold of them and saying, I want life change. I really want to make a difference when it comes to the intake that I'm taking, or when it comes to the way that I act out my faith, or the way that I act within Christian community and what place Christian community has in my life, how I act in Sabbath rest, how I act when it comes to enjoyment in life. These are major issues we talked about last week, where we were grabbing a hold of these, tighter, I at least pray that you did, and then bring it to the table, because the challenge with that, if we're really wrestling with it, and it's great that we've had a week, If you said, I'm going to work on this, and then this week was just the same as the week before, this is a great study for us to dive into. Because anything that we put before God is an idol. Any attitude, anything that we put our trust into, anything that we don't want to release, anything that we become somewhat complacent in, it becomes our new normal, and that's just the way it is, and we stop thinking about it by Monday, any of those things we put before God is an idol. And that's what Paul is going to be talking about this week with the Corinthians and then it turned through the Holy Spirit to us. So let's read into it. And This this is a a decent amount of text, and that's good. Again, I I really want to get more into uh, some extended readings uh, like the the earlier church did. But we're going to read a little, talk a little as we go. And at the beginning, he's just basically setting a foundation for us to work off of. Verse 1, he says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, 
I don't want you to be unaware, sisters, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank for the, from the spiritual walk, rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. It's funny I repeat that twice because with my sexy accent, I don't know if I said it right either time. Rock. Did they all come out? We'll find out. Um, anyways. So what he's doing, again, is he's giving them a common heritage to start off of. He's been all over the place with all these different topics and kind of bringing these things to the forefront. And he says, don't forget that we have a shared heritage. That, and he goes back to Exodus, and he's talking about the Israelites, and he's talking about God's chosen people, and he's talking about the, the season where they had been in bondage for over 400 years and now have gone out into freedom. And it wasn't quite what they thought it was going to look like. They, they go through the Red Sea, they're going into the desert, they end up wandering for 40 years, not because God didn't have a GPS, but because they sinned, and there's repercussions and ripple effects from that sin. And he's getting them back to that area. And he says, let's look at our shared heritage, because either you're Jewish and you physically are part of this heritage. We call them Messianic Jewish today, for those that were Jewish but have accepted Jesus as leader and forgiven their lives. Either you have this physically, or even as a Gentile, which just means not Jewish, um, you share in this heritage because you've accepted Christ and it's part of your spiritual heritage. So let's look at what we have as our, our common ground. They believed in God. When our forefathers went out into the death, they were following God. They made a decision to follow God. For us today in the fulfillment and the new covenant, then that's accepting Jesus as leaving and forgiving your life. In this case, they're following God. They're following God's man. And they, they take and they go out and they're baptized. And I, I think it's interesting how Paul is connecting what the new covenant age is looking at versus what, how it fulfilled also uh, from the Old Testament. They were baptized. When they went through the sea, that's considered a baptism. They went through the water to take and come into the freedom. And then they lived on spiritual food. If you remember the story well, they didn't have a Kroger's or anything close by. They had to count on God for their food. And every day, God gave them manna, bread on the ground that was just there every time they woke up in the morning and just enough for that day except for of course on Fridays because he gave them two days work because they weren't supposed to be working on the Sabbath by gathering food in the same way that you and I live on our intake like we talked last week through his word our daily provision the way that we lean into him and the way that we're encouraged because we need him daily because each day is hard Right? I mean, when Jesus himself says, don't worry about tomorrow because today's got enough to worry about. Right? So, so the, he, he's keep bringing these comparisons between what we do and what they have. And then he says, I just want to make sure you don't miss it. When, when he struck the rock and the water came out and it f- took and gave quench the thirst of, of a million people, that was Jesus. Just how you and I partake of Jesus. Just how he's a constant flowing for our provision in our life. He says, we've got great heritage. We got great things to be able to rely on. And it's interesting to me that this scripture comes into place today as we come to a day like Mother's Day, because again, a lot of us stand on the heritage of our moms who have gone before us. That's not everybody's situation, but a lot of us do. For me personally, I've shared probably every Mother's Day and every time she's in the room. One of the reasons why she doesn't drive up here is because I scare her when I speak. But I, my mom is a hero of my life. My mom was a simple woman. She was not an outspoken woman. Um, again, my dad didn't come to the Lord until when I was about 30. So mom was a spiritual single parent, even though dad was in the house. Uh, if it wasn't for my mom, there's no way I'd be up here in front of you guys. There's no way that I would be the, the father or the, the husband that I am today without mom. Mom is a, a big hero of my, my faith. And a lot of things that she put into place is my foundation. A lot of you guys have that, and that's awesome. And I pray you celebrate that today. Some of us, our moms are still here. I'm still blessed that mom is in our life still. Some of us, our moms have moved on. And maybe today's a little bit tougher because of that. And I, I, I get that. But we have that heritage, that common ground that we can step on, both in our physical as well as our spiritual, because of our spiritual heritage to Jesus Christ. On the other end of that, maybe some of us don't have that at all. There's many people who do not have the moms that I was blessed with. To be fully honest, I, I can talk to you about that on Father's Day on things I wish that my dad and I had growing up that we do now. But some of us just don't have that. Maybe it could be because of an early passing. Maybe it could be mom had struggles. 
And maybe you look at some other people, you, or you hear me talking about my mom and say, I wish I had that. Oh, I wish I had that foundation to lay into. Maybe Mother's Day can kind of pull up some things, and we'll talk about that a little bit later into our gathering as well. But we also have to be cautious, because when we look into other people's lives, sometimes it looks a little bit better than what it really was, and maybe that just wasn't God's plan for you, or maybe it had nothing to do with God's plan, but they're free will choices, and God's going to bless you anyways. For instance, when we continue into this section, we get to verse 5, look at what he says. They messed up. He says, yes, they believed in God. Yes, they followed him in faith. Yes, they were baptized. Yes, they drank of Jesus. Yes, they got their, their food. But nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. So depending on our past, whether it be from the spiritual or the physical, when we look back, there's always lessons to be learned. While we have a lot of great things in common with one another, there's also other things that are not so pleasant that we have. Your path, every path is different. Every path is different, but there's a lot of similarities as well. And so even when we come for bad things, that's things that we can embrace and that Jesus can rectify and that Jesus can take and bring into a resurrection that can be different into our lives. Those things are the things that we look to to encourage us not to make the same mistakes as those who went before us or maybe even the mistakes that we have made before. So let's talk about what this looks like, where that life led them. In verse 7, it says, Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people, shall, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. And don't let that pass too quick, because that's a little over seven times how many people we lost on 9-11. Verse 9, We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. No grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. As he talks about the different things that they were challenged with, the different things that they embraced that were not of God, he purposely shows three. The three that stand out to us are sexual immorality, grumbling, and idol worship. Sexual immorality, again, we are designed, sex is designed for one man, one woman, and a marriage covenant that are committed to one another, and that's where sex lies. That's the gift, that's not just procreation, but that's, that's the gift to bring two people as one as he designed. Anything outside of that, you with me? Anything outside of that is sexual immorality. Premarital, same gender, um, t pornography, whatever the case may be. He has a design for us for a good reason. Because that's where it's safe, and that's where it works, and that's where we're mature and we're committed enough to be able to have this kind of relationship. This is something that they did not follow, and people ran into problems. Does that mean that God is some big vengeful guy just sitting up on this throne ready to throw down lightning at anybody that messes up? Absolutely not. It is because when we sin, it puts us into bondage, and bondage brings ripple effects that brings pain. And he doesn't want that for you. Can I say that God never punishes for sin? No, because he's a jealous God. We'll talk about this. I, he, he's, there's some things about God, quite frankly, I don't understand, and I've learned that not understanding and not believing are two different things. But he definitely is very clear about where sexual morality takes and falls into our lives. He wants better for us. Grumbling. Taking in, being, just being negative. And I'll be honest, like we struggle with sexual immorality in the church. There's people like, but you don't get it, I love her. You don't get it, I love him. You don't get it, we might as well be married. In the eyes of God, we think we're married even though we haven't gotten married. All those fun things. And um, that's... None of that is biblically um, foundational in any way, shape, or form. If you're with somebody and it's like we're married and God thinks we're married and then you break up, it's in the eyes of God or you're divorced. You know, it's just, it doesn't really play out, does it? Same thing with grumbling. I think we have probably a bigger problem with grumbling than we do with sexual morality within the church today. How we act in the break room, how we act on social media, how we act within our household, how we act within our marriages, how we act with our kids, how we act with our parents, how we act with our friends. Grumbling's a big problem. And do you know what it does? It focuses our heart on the things of the world instead of the hope of Jesus Christ. He says, look at where that leads you. 
Look where that leads you. And it all comes into play when we're talking about idol worship because, again, I love him. I want to. I love who I want to. I, this is just how I get this out of my system. This is my release. This makes me feel good in the moment. This, I know it's not what God wants for me, but... Okay, God, I'm sorry. Hold on. I just said, but can I just kind of move you over here and put grumbling up here for a little bit? Now, I, I, I know I shouldn't be talking about them behind me, but can I just move you out of the way, God, so I can just have this moment for myself so I can just release it in the way that I want to release it? This is what he's getting into. It's not okay. It's a lie of the enemy. It's a comfortability of the enemy to put us into places that does not bring us God's best or freedom in our lives. I, if nothing else should grab our attention, it's the wording, don't put Christ to the test. In other words, what he's saying is we're dancing with stuff we shouldn't be dancing with. We're dancing with stuff we shouldn't be dancing with. And we want to kind of feel like God's just kind of patient with us to the point that we can kind of do what we want that won't really matter. But sin does have the ripple effects. We want to be able to kind of have that comfortability and that right within our lives and then come to church and sing, He is jealous for me. He loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of His wind and mercy. You're singing, he's jealous for me and wants his best, and he would do whatever it takes to make me his. So much so that his love is overwhelming like a hurricane that he will bend you like a tree. And we sing it with such comfort and grace and then walk out of here like he's not going to actually do it. He loves you too much to let you stay in that sin. He loves you too much for it to continue on that place. Don't put Christ to the test. Sometimes we kind of get in a good place and things are going better for a while and we get to feeling pretty good about how well we've been doing. And I think this uh, next part kind of grabs our attention a little bit. He says, Therefore, this is verse 12, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. When we feel like we're in our best possible spiritual state and that we're doing really, really well, what Paul says is, hold on there, mister. Stop, stop and really look at things. Because when we get the most confident, that's where we mess up. I, when we have, um, again, I used to do tuxedos and formal wear and at the bookstore or you know, people stepping into new walls at the church that they're being trained on. Whenever I'm training anybody, I always remind them, you're probably going to get this somewhat quick and then you're going to do really good on it for about a month and then you're going to start making a bunch of mistakes. And when I come to you about those mistakes, I'm not coming to be a joke. I just want to let you know up front, it's going to happen. Because when we get comfortable... We start going faster. We start doing, getting a little, uh, I hate to say we're cocky, but that, that kind of, you know, low cockiness. And we're like going through things and just kind of speeding around. And we start missing the little stuff because we just feel comfortable. Same thing happens in our spiritual walk. Don't, don't test Christ. And you're like, okay, so I'm not being like this rebellious. I'm testing Christ. But also don't believe in your own self power and resilience to the point that you won't slip. And all of us at this point should know that a slip in sin can easily lead to a slope in sin. It really can. I mean, Satan doesn't come and just take and say, go to your neighbor and murder him. We're not going to fall for that real quick, right? Grumbling about your neighbor. Finding out when they're home alone. Get the, no, that's taking a dog turn. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm kidding. Oh, I'm so thankful my neighbors of my physical house are not actually in here. That got weird. Here's what we're to do, and we'll put this up on the screen for you. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, and let's just count these out. One, the desires of the flesh. I want what I want. The desires of the eyes, too. I see it, I want it. I see it, I want to be like that. And the pride of life, when we get worldly in our mentality, these things are not from the Father, it's of the world. 
And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. We'll leave that up for a little bit, Chris, if you don't mind. So let's call some of those things out. I, I was kind of playing with this a little, this concept a little bit this, this week with my phone. I don't think a phone, phone is evil. I think some of us uh, can take it to some weird places. I think phone's evil, but it surely easily kind of represents a lot of things that we struggle with when it comes to idols in our lives. Uh, for me personally, if I did not have the calendar on this phone, I would be a royal mess. I live by my schedule on my phone. If somebody says something casually, it goes that I, and I'm like, yeah, I'll send you an email Tuesday. That goes on here. We talked about trying to do cozy. At our house, we have shared calendars, um, and we're still kind of working out how that works. Why is my daughter shaking her head no at me? We've talked about this at home. No, it didn't work. <laughs> We, and, and we still won't get there, but I've got to find a way that not everything I put on my calendar goes on my wife's calendar, or she will beat me. Because I have like 50, 60 things on here every day on just stuff like I've got to remember to check on this on the website, or I've got to send out this with the prayer chain. And it's just the, the schedule is huge. But the schedule cannot become my God. This is a tool to help me, but it cannot become my God. And I know we're going back to some of the things we've talked about Last week, I know we're talking about things that we probably talked about a billion times over. And when we all get it and are victorious in it every single second of our life, I promise I'll stop talking about it. In other words, in heaven. So, but when it comes to our schedule, it really can't be our God. Especially if you have kids. Especially if you have all these things that you want to get done. And if I look at my schedule and God rules... It's going to look different than if I want what I want. There's going to be choices I've made that are under God instead of what I want or my family wants or what my spouse wants. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to be in church every time it's open or else you're sinning. What I'm saying is if God is forced, your family and your spouse and your friends and your witness will be taken care of. But it's a matter of balance. If you come here on Sunday morning, it's like, Phew, and maybe it's, Twice a month that you get here. It's just like, oh, I finally got schedule. I just kind of got things real good. And that's all the more intake you've got going in. We're going back to last week. You're not getting the right intake. No wonder you're running like a car that's out of, out of gas because your schedule, some of the things on your schedule, might be falling into what we're talking about today. Now, that's not the only thing I do on my schedule. Again, we talk about these things often because they're masters in our lives if we're not careful. But I do my finances through my phone for the most part. My PNC app is on here. It does pretty good. I like it. It has all kinds of tools on it. And if it wasn't for that, I'd be in trouble. But Billy Graham once said, if you really want to find out what people worship, look in their checkbook. Maybe I don't just look at my schedule. Maybe I look at how I'm spending my money. What matters to me? I had a friend um, who was here at the church for several years, and we had some different ways of of looking at some, some different things, but one thing we definitely were on the same page with uh, had, had to do in the area of time, and I think it applies to money too, is um, he said, look, if somebody really wants to do something, they'll find the time for it. And he's kind of trying to make it like a point, point, but the reality was saying, like, I don't want to do that, so I don't, I'm too busy to do that. If you want to do something, you'll make the time for it. And if you want to invest in Christian community, you'll make the time for it. If you want to invest in other people's lives and have lunch with them or have coffee with them to talk to them about Jesus or what's going on in life and build relationships, you'll make time for it. It's just we do what we, what we do. I mean, if my son was coming back to Ohio, we were talking about kids just a little bit ago, Amy and I were, and with the daughter here. My son came back to Ohio. I cancel all kinds of stuff to be able to have lunch. We make time for what we want to do. Is it an idol or is it not? Financially? I don't have money, I don't have money, I can barely get groceries. Oh, I just need time, I need time. I'll, hey, a week's vacation. Oh, yeah, I've got, I'll, I'll make money to go down to the Smoky Mountains for a week. It's just choices that we make. We feel like they might have more control than what they, they actually do some, sometimes. Um, ego? Anybody struggle with this, with ego? You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Unless you really want people to look at you because you're egotistical. Um, ho- holy cow. How many selfies can I take? How many likes do I need? How many shares do I have to have? I know pastors who struggle with this on Sunday afternoons. As soon as they get home, they check to see how many people shared or said something good about their church service because that's their validation. 
Ego comes in this. We can put that before God in a heartbeat. Other people want me to do this. I'm going to do this. I know it's not what God wants, but idol worship. Um, Pornography? Sexual immorality? I think the number is a little over 60% of the men within the church struggle with pornography. What things do we take and put before God? These are things that we struggle with. Do not love the world. Don't love the things in the world. If, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's big. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing. It's passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Um, what we're talking about, I think, and at the heart of things is temptation. I think we're talking about struggling with um, what we want or what, uh, quite frankly, uh, one thing that helps me is I, I realize when a desire comes in that that's some evil principality whispering in my ear to do something that's not right. Uh, temptation is powerful. I think all of us would agree with that pretty quickly. And um, so I was doing some reading up on temptation, and I came across some notes from a pastor that nobody around here has probably ever heard of. I'd never heard of. His name's Pastor Mark Autraj. And if I ever meet the man, I'll apologize for hacking his last name. Um, but in his notes, I thought they were good, and I wanted to share them with you. There's two things about temptation that we have to keep in mind. One is to do, um, not underestimate the power of temptation. We all agree that, that it's hard, but I think... Uh, sometimes we're bad at underestimating that, pa- that power of the temptation um, in a couple of different ways. I think, one, we normalize sin in our lives. Maybe it's because of how we were raised or uh, something that we've just gotten so accustomed with we no longer struggle with it. Uh, we might not even realize it's, it's sin, per se. Maybe we have kind of uh, justified it away. Um, I don't know. There's a, there's a lot of ways that we can kind of underestimate it or think that it's not that big of a deal. There's, uh, I've talked to you guys about this many times. Anytime that we have ourselves in a situation where we say, okay, this 90% of my life is yours, God, but this 10% is still kind of mine. I know that ho- is horrible when I say it like that, but a lot of times we really do act like that. We really do. It's like this, but this, just this is mine. Um, that, that's underestimating that power, that temptation. He is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane, I am a tree, bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. The 10%'s not yours. It's his. It's his. And he loves you. And he'll go after that. And so we kind of have to look at those areas and say, this is something that really is serious. Um, I think sometimes we underestimate the power of temptation in an area that we're struggling, and we think, well... A little bit won't hurt anything. It's back to that kind of slippery to get into the slope. Uh, I hear this a lot from people who struggle with uh, different addictions, uh, whether that be with drugs or sex or alcohol. Um, you know, yeah, I used to be an alcoholic, but I'm better now, so it's really no big deal that I have a beer on Friday night. Don't underestimate temptation. I've seen so many people go straight back into bondage with that type of lie of the enemy. Uh, yeah, you know, I know I'm a Christian now, but it really won't hurt if I just go to this party. It's just all my friends are going to be there. Don't. I wish somebody had said to me, and uh, trust me, I say it to my, my kids at the appropriate time, so one of them hasn't heard this yet. Um, if you have a boyfriend and girlfriend relationship, you might not be doing anything, but there's no reason to lay down on the couch and watch a movie together. There's no reason to be laying down on a bed with each other. That's just temptation. I remember talking to, and I've shared with our youth group before, when I was dating and younger, asking uh, some youth leaders, like, how far is too far? Uh, And their advice to me was horribly bad. Horribly bad. It's like, well, you don't want to do this, but this isn't too bad. That's just a gateway to, okay, now we've done this, I'm kind of tempted by this, and now I'm done. Well, there's always going to be a next step we're tempted by. Let's kind of keep the ball a little bit higher than what we are. Let's not underestimate that temptation and those things that come into place. The other thing that he talked about um, and this would be the second one, it, it, not just not underestimating the power of the temptation, but balancing things out of not overestimating the power of temptation. I talk to a lot of people who say, you don't understand the temptation is so great, I just can't fight it. 
you don't understand there's just no way I can get this out of my life or this addiction out of my life or this poison out of my life in an unhealthy way, whatever the case may be. Um, and we feel powerless against temptation. The scripture is very clear that there is, again, every path is different, but there's a lot of similarities. And there is absolutely no temptation that you are going through, who have gone through, that someone else has not also gone through and have not found victory through Jesus Christ over that temptation. When we think the temptation is stronger than what we have on, on the power side of things with God, uh, it, it has as much real logic as someone saying, I can't walk into the church or the ceiling will fall in on me. And some people actually feel that way. And that's not reality. I was talking to somebody this week that went to a church, actually felt that that was going to happen. That was part of their story. That she was prepared to die to go into that church because she believed that. That's a lie. There is no temptation that you're dealing with that you cannot have victory through Jesus Christ over. And that's the second part of not overestimating. That temptation is absolutely strong. It's absolutely overwhelming. But Jesus Christ is more powerful than any temptation this world has ever known. Can he take it out of your life like this when you give it to him? Absolutely. Most of the time, not. But he will walk through that path and he will walk through those ripple effects and then we go back to having the proper intake and we have the proper rest and we have the proper proper action, we have the proper community, we have the proper enjoyment, and we grow to be more like Jesus to have victory through him. We can't underestimate temptation. We can't overestimate temptation as well. Verse 13, that last one I shared with you, is a voice that really shakes me. I just want, and it has for a long time. As a man who's a sinner, it shakes me. There was a never a time, according to the scripture, that you are tempted that he doesn't provide a way out. So in that moment, when I'm in front of somebody and I want to say something that is not godly, or if I'm thinking about doing something and I know it's not godly, he provides a way out. It's like, ah, I don't want to know that. I want to feel like it's out of my control. Right? I just want it to be out there. And, and usually, if we're kind of somewhat in step with Jesus, usually it's a whisper. Like, don't do this again. Or you can close that laptop. Or you can walk away from this situation. And we just have that moment. And that voice comes to my mind every time. And it's like, stop it. Sometimes I just want to do what I want to do. But here you are with that way out. And a lot of times he gets me with it. And sometimes I'm rebellious and a sinner. He provides a way out. If we're not in step with him, and we found that that sin is now a comfort zone, and we decide we want to do what we want to do, his voice will get louder and he will come in creative ways through another person, through the way the circumstances change, yelling, whatever it takes to get you away from the bondage. He is jealous for me. His love's like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. I shared it with you many times about when I was just completely stubborn in my early 20s, in an area of sin where I was taking money from a place I worked at. I was taking 50 bucks here, 20 bucks here, I have a cash register for a long period of time, struggled with it, did better, did worse. And the very last night, if you've not heard testimony, just a very short version of this, um, I felt impressed on my heart as if I heard it myself, if you do this again, I'll take you out. It's something I had struggled with for so long and I felt that and I'd never had it that powerful in my life and I did it anyways. And it was the night I was caught, and two days later I was in handcuffs. You know why? Because my God loves me so much that he won't let me stay there. And if he's got to lay me out to the point that everybody in my small town knows that I'm a hypocrite to get me to look up, he will lay you out like Paul on the road to Damascus to get you to look up because you're not doing it any other way because he loves you. And his love's like a hurricane. And you're bendable. And he will restore you. It doesn't have to get to that point. What if I just simply said yes much sooner? And I stand here before you, even though I was a great Christian kid all, all the years I grew up, this is what I was talking to this person about because they've gone through some similar things in their life. Um, it was really bubbled, and that, that's really a lot of my mentality of 90% of this is yours, God, but this is how I'm paying my bills over here, and this is how I justify it over here. Um, it all comes from 
the, the, the simple truth that he loves us enough to grab us and to pull us close to him. He always provides an escape. So what do we do? Let me give this other voice. It's right there in front of you, but I'm going to put it up on the screen because I want to talk about it with you for a second. Verse 14. This is what we do. In any area that you grab today that's a margin for you, therefore, he says therefore because he says, since God loves you, since he would do whatever it takes to give you freedom, since he has already gotten the victory, the greatest victory and gift that he can put into your life, since he always provides a way out of temptation, if you will take it, because he has done so much, therefore, my beloved. He's not saying this as you are messing up, you are being judged, everybody's looking at you. You're, you're sc- He's saying, therefore, my brother, my sister, I get it. I love you. God loves you. I'm reaching out to you because this is an intense desire to see freedom in your life. Because of what God has done, you who I love, flee. Flee from whatever thing that you would put right here today as far as what is the idol that I'm wrestling with or what maybe is the two or three idols that I am wrestling with. While you look at this, flee from those things. Not just wrestle with it, not just kind of deal with it, not take and talk about it, but do whatever it takes to get away from that. I always think of Joseph when we get to this point, when Joseph was the master over the, um, the Potiphar's household. And Potiphar's wife thought he was pretty cute and she wanted to bed him. And so when he was gone one day, Potiphar was, she grabbed Joseph and she was trying to entice him back in the bed. Everybody know this story? we got all kinds of great children bedtime stories in the scripture. And she's pulling him in. I personally believe that he was tempted to dive. Dive right in. Because his response was pulling himself out of the coast she had hold of and running out of the house. He fled from the temptation. I, I didn't see him like trying to have a talk. Well, no, this isn't God's thing and this is what I do. He fled from the situation. And that's the mentality I think some of us need to adopt from the idols that's in our lives this morning. I need to flee from it. I need to put safeguards into it. I need to get an accountability partner that I feel safe to be able to share what I'm struggling with, that they have the openness to ask me about it and talk to me about it as the week goes on. How many people have an accountability partner over some area of your life? Hands up. Wisdom, 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 wisdom. If you don't, grab it. Grab it. Get somebody in there to help you. Get a champion to fight with you. One, two, maybe three people. Whatever it takes. Flee from it. We've talked about putting safeguards on your computer if that's what you need. Talked about putting somebody outside of your life for a while if that's what you need. If you're floating with somebody and you're married, you need to put some boundaries in. You need to flee. Because that slippery slope gets real slopey real fast. Therefore, my beloved, flee from anything that you would put before God. From the idolatry. 